Am I here? I'm here. Okay. So I've never done back-to-back services before, like a two-service deal. I've always been in one-service churches. I don't know why, but hopefully I'm not a one-service wonder here, (laughs) and I'm going to do the best that I can. Uh, Man, worship, thank you for that. That that Living Hope song, the first service, I thought I was going to die, man. It was just like (laughs) a real ugly cry kind of moment stuff going on. So uh, thank you for the worship team. You guys are awesome, and uh, it was just a good, good, sweet time. Um, yeah, that, that testimony was a lot of fun. Uh, she squeezed me pretty good. She was pretty excited once we, uh, once we started praying because, you know, the thing is, when I prayed the first time, um, she didn't, uh, she didn't have that much of a breakthrough the very first time. And it was like, she said it was a seven out of 10 and I prayed again and it, it, it was a six. And so, uh, she's like, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to believe for more. And I'm like, no, we're going to pray right now. We're going to keep going after it. She's like, oh, okay. So we went after it again, and it went from a six to a two. And so, I'm, and so she's like, oh, this is awesome. And then I'm like, well, but the two is going to go to a zero now, so let's just go after it again. And so we went after it again. I'm telling you, just like Matt said, there was a moment. I felt it happen. She felt it happen. She looked at me like I did something. I didn't do nothing. And we're both like, what was that? And then she was good. I mean, and full out, like, crocodile tears, like, big, big tears. And God just, just did a thing. And it was right there. It wasn't 2,000 years ago, you know, on a Jerusalem road or something. It was, like, right there. I'm for real. It just happened. Like, I, I didn't even, I barely had, <laughs> yeah, there you go. Like, I barely had time to go to the bathroom because that's what we were doing. I'm like, in between services, you know, one of my biggest fears is having to go to the bathroom once I get up here. So that's, that's one of my biggest fears. My other biggest fear is going to the bathroom with the mic pack on and not turning it off. So what I do when I go to the bathroom with the mic pack on is I just literally unplug it, put it in my back pocket. There's probably too much information for you to know, but nice to meet you. I'm Grant. It's okay. Just go when you got to go. Just, yeah, there you go. Uh, I have a, a beautiful wife here. She's, uh, her name is Tabitha, and uh, I, didn't, I had my kids in here for the first service, so they're really wonderful. Tabby's really wonderful. She's a woman of God. Uh, she's a walking miracle, literal walking miracle. She had 12 hours to live back in 2017. Doctor told me that, 12 hours to live. So I was getting like, like starting to think about making plans, if, that, if you get my drift here. And... Uh, and God just pulled her out of it. And she is, she's healthier now than she was before she got, I mean, she is like, I mean, you'll, you'll, if you meet her, if you get the privilege of meeting her, just meet her. Because she's just this like radiant beam of light. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's Tabby. I love her to death. She's wonderful. And uh, that's a weird pun to make at that point. Sorry about that. Too soon. Yes. <laughs> um, so. Let's do this. Before we get into it, we'll go to John 16. So flip there while we're talking. But I'm going to pray because I don't like to get going before I just submit everything to the Holy Spirit, okay? So Holy Spirit, we love you. We thank you for the testimony of what you did this morning. My goodness, I love your power. I love your power not just because it's cool. I love your power because... You are true to your word. You are who you say you are. You do what you say you're going to do. We just take you at your word this morning. And we believe for more this morning. We believe that's just the beginning. We believe for more. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so um, I, I came here with three words, okay? Three words. I have preached for a long time. I've been preaching now for, it sounds... Sounds unreal for me to say it out loud, but for 14 years, and um, because I started when I was just a little pup, 18 years old, and uh, so I've been preaching for a long, long time. And there's a there's kind of a when you do it for a long time, you kind of get into a you get into a rhythm, and you kind of know what the deal is. Um, But I can tell you this: I've never once mailed it in because I take this thing really, 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 really seriously. 
Because the word says, let him who speaks, speaks as though he's speaking the words of God. That's not a light. That's not a light charge by any stretch of the imagination. Right? Paul, Paul told Timothy, preach the word. He said, don't let him, let, don't let him look down on you for, because of your age. Don't let him look down on you. And then he said, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. And I have taken that seriously my entire time doing this thing. So I promise you I'm not going to mail it in today. But usually I have at least some sense of a, like a flow, you know? I'm kind of like, okay, I'm going to go, I'm going to do this verse. This thing does not like my ear, by the way. I'm going to do this verse and I'm going to kind of go here. And you kind of have an idea of where you're going to go. And this week it was different because um, I drive a lot, like a lot, a lot, a lot. And so a lot of times what I'll do is I'll have a note, like an a auto note or an audio note that I'll just dictate stuff into, like when God speaks to me. And um, I kept expecting just stuff. And he only gave me three words. There is more. Seriously, that's all that he gave me. There is more. And it was up to me to just kind of look for the rest. But I'm here, literally the reason why I'm here today, if you take nothing else away from today, I need you to understand this. There's more. If you are a believer in this room, if you've been saved for 50 years, and you've walked with God for 50 years, and you've seen God do amazing things for 50 years, and you are as full of the Spirit as one human being can be, my same, the same thing applies to you. There is more. If you are a brand new believer, the same thing applies to you right now. There is more. And I, there's different you know, levels of faith in the room right now. There's diff- people have different expectations of why, why they come into this room. And why they do this thing called church. Everybody has different expectations and, and, and what, what they're about and why they do this thing. But I, I've seen so, so much in my life that I can confidently come to you and say, there is more. Many of us are satisfied to just have a good life. And, and, and do the right stuff and try to be a good moral person. And we think that that's what God wants of us. We think like, man, I just, I just do a little more good than I do bad. And I you know, just try to do my best. And then I'll go to heaven in the sweet by and by. And we'll be together someday. Glory. Hallelujah. <laughs> right? And we, and we think like you get saved. You have that conversion experience. You're like, this is amazing. And then you're like, all right. So when are we going? Oh, I got, I got 40 more years left? Okay, then see you once a week, Jesus, right? <laughs> I'm, I can't be the only one that's experienced this. And, and I, I've seen enough to know there's more. I hear rumors mainly because I, I listened to last week's message that Matt spoke. But I hear rumors that part of why you guys exist in the first place is because you wanted to go deeper. I got good news for you. We're going to go deeper. And then you know what? I have even better news for you. The next week, when I'm I'm back at my home church and I'm preaching there, you know what is going to happen here? You're going to go deeper. Because that's half the battle. Half the battle is actually wanting to go deeper. Because let's be straight up, people. 60 to 70%. And I'm, I'm literally, guys, I'm not exaggerating. I've been in a lot of churches. 60% 60% 60 to 70% of the church doesn't want to go deeper. They want to have the service, do the Kiwanis and the Bible VBS. They want to read their Bible every now and then and call it a day. I don't believe that that's you. That better be Jesus. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> he texts me all the time. No. <laughs> When Matt told me what you guys were talking about, about the unseen, I was like, oh, so much time. We need so much time, but we don't have so much time, so we got to run. I'm going to go as fast as I possibly can, okay? But I've been unusually weepy. I've been unusually weepy since last night when I was thinking, I'm going into this thing, you know, I kind of know what you're getting yourself into, and I've just been like, something so tender. And then worship, I was, I was weepy. And then another person came up to me, and they were talking about like, man, I cry like a baby. And I'm like, yes, God's doing, I know God's doing something here. I can walk in this room and know God's doing something here. Amen. <laughs> I, don't know, I don't know anything about y'all. 
I just know you're on the cusp of something. And as you're standing there on the cusp of something, you're like, right here, I'm going to go just, I'm hopefully just going to, because I'm going to go right down here, there's more. (laughs) Okay. Okay. I want to tell you a tiny bit of my story so you at least know somewhat of who I am uh, so that you're not like, okay, I know his name's Grant. That's about it. And that he has a wife and children. Hey, but he who finds a wife gets favor from the Lord. And wisdom, most of the time, is personified as a woman in Scripture. That's all i got to say about that. Okay. It is interesting. Like, the, the main staff, there's a lot more women than there are. I mean, Matt, there's Matt. <laughs> <laughs> so Matt was actually, we, my wife and I planted a church when I was, I was 23. She was 22. I told the first service, like, I don't recommend it because we didn't know what the heck we were doing. Matt was our first worship leader. Yeah, it was awesome. And I've known Matt even, even before that point. Um, but I didn't, I've never experienced teacher Matt. I've only experienced worship leader Matt. And I listened to the message last week, and I saw a teacher Matt, and I'm going, yeah, <laughs> there it is, right? Like, it was not that you aren't a good worship leader. I just went, Whoa. Like, it just clicked, you know? Okay. So um, I went to high school at Smithville High School, home of the Warriors. No one cheered. I see where I'm at. <laughs> I was expecting at least one woo, you know? I, I guess, guess it's no one here. Um, when I was 18, God got a hold of my life in a radical way. I went from darkness into light, death to life, completely radical change. Um, and all of my friend group at the time was like, you're different. And they didn't want to hang out with me anymore because I wasn't as fun to be around for the things that they were doing because I wasn't doing them. And there was this thing called conviction, and they didn't want to be around me because they're like, something's different. And I didn't have to tell them. It just happened. And so God got a hold of my life. I knew nothing about the, I mean, I literally, I'd been in church my entire life, and I knew one verse because I used to sit, the church I went to had a three-point line because it was a gym. And I sat on the three-point line, and I would just look at the basket, because all I cared about was basketball, okay? But my, se- my senior year of high school, God told me to give up basketball. It was all like, I mean, I know, you can tell I'm a basketball player, because I'm like 6'4", right? It's like, <laughs> you're like, he must dunk, you know? Um, but it's all I cared about, and then God said, it's time to let it go, and he was calling me into something more. And uh, so I got this idea for a thing called prayer at center court. And it was just, we're going to just get in the gym and we're going to pray for our school. And I didn't have like a plan. I didn't know what I was doing. So I started this group and kids started showing up. And kids from other schools started showing up. And alumni started showing up. And teachers started showing up. And they were like, don't tell everyone I'm here, you know, because like, they're not supposed to, you know, intermingle that stuff. <clears throat> but God did some amazing things. At the end of the year, we had hundreds of students go throughout the school, praying over lockers, praying over kids, praying, proclaiming the name of Jesus. It was to the point where uh, the actual the school board had a meeting about whether we're allowed to do what we were doing. And we used to pray every single night for this group. We didn't know what we were doing. So we're like, all we know to do is pray. So we would just pray and pray and pray and pray and pray and pray and pray. And one night we're like, because we would pray, in, we prayed in a tree house once. We prayed in the car. We prayed everywhere. And so one night we're like, let's go to the school and pray. So we did. We went to the school, and we laid hands on the building. We didn't know what was going on. There was a school board meeting that night. They were on the other side of the wall. And we're putting our hands on the building, and we're praying, and we're like, God, just, you know, we're like teenagers do. We were a little more animated. And uh, so we're praying over this thing, and this lady comes out of the school and walks over, and she's bawling. She's like, guys, right now, in this room, the one, right behind, the one right behind this wall, they are having a meeting, a heated discussion about whether you're allowed to keep doing this or not. And so she got on the wall and started praying with us. Guess what? They voted we were still allowed to do it. <laughs> and so God got a hold of my life because I was like, well, I can't just kind of, you know, go to youth group and call it a day from here on out. It's not going to work. Because God's done too much already. It was literal revival. I, I, I don't say that lightly. It was revival happened in my school. And, um, and so then this, this guy that also 
actually went to Smithville, and I didn't even know it, which is hard. Well, he was older than me, but he came up, and he started prophesying to me. You ever got a prophetic word? (laughs) There was some woos there, more than when I said Smithville. (laughs) And so so he started prophesying to me, and and he prophesied this word that was just like, oh, man, I guess I have no more. I got to move forward. I can't go back anymore. Like something, there's something more. And, and he invited me to come with him to this conference in Iowa. It was a few weeks later. And uh, in between that time, I got baptized in the Holy Spirit. And uh, that change was nearly as drastic as the one that happened when I got saved. And people were like, what the heck happened to you? Because all of a sudden, I was like a walking ball of fire. I had a fire in my bones. And I go, whoa. Whoa. There's something more. And so we went to Iowa and we went to this conference. It was amazing. It was awesome. And we were like, we can't just let this stay where we're at. And so when it was lunch break time, we're like, let's just go out on the streets and pray for people. So we went out on the streets to pray for people. And we came across this lady. She was in a wheelchair. She had something, a degenerative issue in her spine. Could not, you know, she was confined to her wheelchair. Her son was with her. He was very weirded out because we asked him, we're like, can we pray for you? And he's like, oh, that's not my thing. See you later. And so we start to pray for this lady, and uh, before I know it, her eyes get huge. And she's like, and she could feel something happening in her back. And then she got up out of her wheelchair and took off running. And she ran. Oh, there was this fountain. It's in downtown Des Moines. There's this fountain that has this, like, terraced step thing. And she ran down the stairs, and she ran up the stairs. She's, like, just yelling the whole time. And her son is looking at us like, what is wrong with you? Like, what is going on? And um, I will say this. When you see someone get out of a wheelchair, you start to go, maybe there's more. <laughs> like, I'm cool with Bible study, and I'm cool with doing the stuff at the church. I love Bible studies. my jam, actually. But I'm like, I'm not content to just attend a church. There's more. Okay? And so then we went on, and we planted a church. Well, I skipped a few steps. We went to ministry school and just got blasted there. And we went there with the purpose of coming back to plant a church. Fun, fun little story. Joe Rita over here. So Tabby and I, we wanted to get married, but we were very young. We were just little babies. And people did not like that idea. And Joe Rita was like, initially was like, oh, I'm not sure about this. And then you know what she did? She prayed. And she goes, I think this is God. And she is one of, the, one of the sole reasons why we're married. Somebody prayed, right? So anyway, we plant this church, and uh, we didn't know what we were doing. Matt started us in worship, awesome. And then he, he, got, he got, a, got a good, you know, good job, got paid, you know, more than we could possibly pay him because we were poor. <laughs> and so, and, uh, and, and, and. This church, man, we didn't know what we were doing, but we knew we could just, we could just, we just wanted to go after his presence. That's it. That's all we knew. And so we just went after his presence, and then miracles started happening like a lot, like a lot, a lot, like a lot, a lot. And people were getting saved. People were getting filled with the Spirit. And I, we saw God do some incredible things in that time. And I, and I, wa- I, we did that for six years. And I'm, I'm convinced even more now, there's more. Even, like, guys, I'm telling you, this is not an exaggeration. The amount of things we saw, even in just that first few years, is like the amount of things you read when you read the book of Acts. I'm not joking. And that's not because we were learned, educated, did something right, you know. It's not because I have a master's in divinity, because I don't. It's not because we, you know, got blessed by the Pope or something. Like, we didn't know what we were doing. We didn't know anything. All we knew is, come Holy Spirit. And we just let him have his way. That was the key. We just said, you have your way. And you'd be amazed at how many people are opposed to the idea of saying, come Holy Spirit, have your way, and actually being okay with when he has his way. I tell, I'm, I'm telling you these testimonies. I have, there's a lot that I want to tell you. There's a lot of testimonies. I'll tell you one real quick. We were in Oklahoma ministering at a church, and uh, we went to Denny's afterward. You ever had just some good late-night Denny's? 
It's a nice little gut bomb at 11 p.m., you know? <clears throat> and there was this group of ladies there. They were all wearing the same color shirt. And we were just, like, drawn to it. And so we asked these ladies, like, can we pray? Does anybody have pain? Can we pray for you? And this lady had a growth on her stomach that was, like, the size of a grapefruit. You know what's going to happen, don't you? We're like, oh, my gosh, can we pray for that? So we prayed for it, and guess what? Grapefruit gone. Did you hear me? Grapefruit gone. As in no mass, no growth. And I'm telling you this not because I want a pat on the back because it literally has nothing to do with me. I want to take zero credit for it because it is not anything that I can do. It is literally because we've moved out of the way and said, Holy Spirit, do what you want to do. Because he is so much more eager to do what he wants to do than you are to let him do what he wants to do. That's a mouthful. Try to say that one a few times. So I, I literally came here to tell you there is more. There's more. But there's this dividing line here for you that you have, to, you have to make a decision about. The Holy Spirit is either going to be a theological subject to you or a person. He's either going to be something that you talk about maybe every couple years because a few people are interested as a subject, or he's going to be the living, breathing presence of God that is as vital to you advancing the kingdom as oxygen is to breath. I'm telling you, it's one or the other. And most of us are content to be over here. Honestly, we're uncomfortable with this other side because it's like we have to protect his reputation or something. Well, what if he doesn't? Yeah, but what if he does? Can you imagine what would it be like if this body of believers began to believe God to such a degree that no single human with cancer walked in the door and walked out with it? The only reason I say that is because it's actually possible. We just sang it. You said if we would ask, we would receive. Well, ask. Okay. I went, I, we used to do this street ministry on uh, First Fridays. You ever been to First Fridays in the crossroads? They do painting and all that kind of stuff, and it's like an art thing. But we used to set up this this little tent that just said compliments and encouraging words, free, like free compliments and encouraging words. And we actually gave away art too, but so people would just come up to the tent and what we would do is we'd start encouraging them and then we'd sneak in some prophecy in there <laughs> and people would be like, how'd you know that? Why'd you know that? What's that about? And then you'd, it's, a really, it's a really good door to just go, mm. well, the thing is, it was God that was talking to me and you want to know him, you know, it's really cool. And this one girl pulled me aside, and she's like, wait a second. Like, you're a church, aren't you? You're like, this ain't, you ain't just being nice. And like, well, yeah, we're a church. And she goes, do you guys believe in the Holy Spirit? And I'm telling you, it's one of the most frustrating moments. I think I've, I've seen a lot of things not bow before and been really frustrated, but it's one of the frust most frustrating things I've ever come across because I went, we're 2,000 years into this thing. 2,000 years into this thing, and we have believers asking each other, wait, do you believe in the Holy Spirit? Romans 14 says this, the kingdom of God is not in eating or drinking, but in righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. So what does that mean? That means if I want to be kingdom people, well, I can't be kingdom people because people's plural and I'm singular, but if we want to be kingdom people, it's going to start in the place of the Holy Spirit. The all-encompassing life of the kingdom, your access to that is through the Holy Spirit. Jesus did a finished work. You ever, called, you ever heard that called? When he, when he does, you know, what he did on the cross is called the finished work? You know why? Jesus is done working. That may mess with your head. It may mess with your theology. Jesus is done working. He's seated at the right hand of the Father. And he's like, my work's done. That doesn't mean he can't be intimate. That doesn't mean he can't be close. But he's, he's like, the work that he did was so profound and so strong that it still speaks a better word today. It reverberates through all of eternity. And so the way that God works on the earth today is he goes, I'm going to send you myself in the person of the Holy Spirit. But he has to be a person to you, not a subject. 
And so people, what they get weirded out about is when you start talking about the Holy Spirit, they're really afraid that uh, you're going to take it too far. I mean, I like, Holy Spirit, it's, he's good, you know? He's there to convict me of my sin. And that's what people know. Like, if I'm bad, he just bops me. I mean, can we be honest? And so people get afraid that you're going to overemphasize the Holy Spirit. But the Holy Spirit is just as much God as Jesus is. The Holy Spirit is just as much God as the Father is. So the question becomes, how do you overemphasize God when you're trying to tell people about the things of God? That's a question you have to ask yourself. Believe me, I know that there are fanatical people out there. I call them conference crazies. There's one lady, every conference I went to, I swear, she knew. She would come in with a Jesus fish tambourine and just bang that thing. (laughs) I'm telling you. (laughs) Listen, I understand that there are people that are fanatical. Yes, people can get all wrapped up in signs, wonders, all that kind of stuff. I get that. But you can't overemphasize the Holy Spirit. He's God. Some of the manifestations of that, some people place weird emphasis on things. That's for them to deal with. It's between them and God. They'll figure it out. What you need to know is you cannot overemphasize the Holy Spirit because he is literally God inside of you. (laughs) Are you in John 16 yet? Okay. This, this, I want to get in the word because where we go wrong is that we, uh, people that do go into this place is that they start losing sight of the word and become fanatical about the things of the Spirit. And the moment you move away from the Word in those things, it goes into weirdness. It's how cults start. It is. Or just really weird churches. So John Wimber, do you know who he is? (laughs) I hope so. (laughs) I really hope so. Man, I was telling first service, sometimes I just go back and walk. I'm not even, I'm not, I'm not vineyard. I didn't grow up in the vineyard. I'm not part of the vineyard. I'm not any of that. But I go back and watch these old tapes. I watch John Wimber, man. Some of the things that the Holy Spirit did. And he was initially resistant to it. Do you know that? He was. And then God was like, mm, I got other options for you. <laughs> but he used to say this, all word and no spirit we dry up. All spirit and no word we blow up. With the spirit and the word we grow up. So I want to get in the word. In John 16, verse 5 says this, but now I am going to him who sent me, and none of you asked me, where are you going? But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. But I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you, but if I go, I will send him to you. What did that just say? You have to stop when you're reading the word, and you have to go, what did that just say? Because what it said is that Jesus is speaking to his disciples. This is, listen, he's about out of here. He's about headed to the cross. I mean, there's not much time left at this point. And what he says to them is, guys, listen, I got um, some big news for you. When I, I'm getting ready to go. I'm going back to the Father. But hear me out. This is a good thing. It's good that I go. Because when I go, then I can send the helper. Many of us would say, I would, how much of us would just love if we were in a worship service this morning and Jesus showed up in the flesh (laughs) you know, you'd be like, is the camera on, right? And Jesus is saying, no, it would actually be better if the Holy Spirit moved in your midst. Now, he really said this. He really said that it would be better. He, in fact, he said it would be advantageous that I go. That word for advantage right there, it's, it's, it's the idea of someone helping you carry something. Okay? Because what he's saying is, listen, you need someone to help you carry what I'm about to tell you. What he's about to tell you is this. He, when he comes, will convict the world concerning right, sin, righteousness, and judgment. Concerning sin, because they do not believe in me. Concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father, and you no longer see me. And concerning judgment, because the rule of this world has been judged. Those three verses, you could spend weeks on them. They're so good. I have many more things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. 
What did I just say about being the advantageous thing? It's someone that help, someone comes along to help you bear weight. Jesus is saying, I have so much to do in you and so much to say to you and so much to give to you, but if I gave it to you in your current state, it would crush you. You can't handle it. So I need to go because if I go, then my Father will send the Spirit. And what he's saying is, what I have to give to you is so heavy, so weighty, so glorious that I'm going to have to live inside of you for you to be able to handle it. But cool, just go to church and then hit up the Mexican restaurant on your way out and then we'll see you next week, right? No! Jesus is saying, what I have for you is so deep and so heavy, I'm going to have to come alongside of you, live inside of you for you to even be able to carry it. Have I, have I, um, have I told you that there's more yet? Have I said that? Because it sure seems like Jesus was thinking the same thing. It seems like he was thinking... There's a lot more. You guys, listen, they had three and a half years with Jesus. The miracles that he did, the end of John says, if they were to try to write them down, all the books in the world wouldn't be able to contain it. What he did in his ministry in three and a half years. And Jesus is saying to them, uh, there's more. And the reason that there's more is because you won't see me anymore. Because it won't just be me. There's more because I'm about to go and the spirit that's inside of me will come and live in every single one of you. So the reason that there's more is because there's more. <laughs> that's how words work, right? Okay. I love that Jesus says, I go to the Father and you see me no more. How many of you know the unseen realm is deeper and greater, and stronger, and more glorious than the seen realm. We live so much by what we see. And Jesus is telling them, I'm about to give you an upgrade, because right now you see me, but you're about to walk into the world of the unseen. <sighs> okay. So, um, once again, there's more. There's more. And uh, it's on the other side of comfort. Okay? Okay. Many people don't move into the more because they're really uncomfortable with, well, what if? What if he asked me to give up something I love? What if I look like an idiot? Well, you'll be in great company. You will. You know what they said about the disciples on the day of Pentecost? They said, oh, look at these foolish drunkards. I think you're in pretty good company when you start looking like what the body of Christ looked like at the day of Pentecost. Here's the best, best piece of news I can give you today. The Holy Spirit is as available to you right now as he was to them on that day. Literally right now. Same availability. Okay. The truth is that the organizations of this world can accomplish everything that the church can accomplish in the natural there is actually a church of humanism. Literally all it is is people get together, sing nice songs, donate, have a nice uplifting message, and go home. They wanted to have church without God, and it's a real thing. And guess what? They do all the same stuff. Here's the difference. They don't have the abiding presence of God. What will, make, what will make us different than every other organization on the planet? Well, first of all, we're not an organization. We're an organism. It's a living body of Christ. You are the body of Christ. Christ, the anointed one, the embodiment of his anointing. The world is supposed to know us. Supposed to recognize us by there's something different on those people. They may do all the same stuff. They may do all the same stuff. I don't know about you, but I don't, I don't see anybody getting healed of cancer at bingo night. I don't know if anybody goes to bingo night here. We're pretty young, young people, it looks like. <laughs> if you go to bingo night, no offense. We have to position ourselves as a body 
position ourselves as a church to say, if, if he doesn't show up, we're toast. It's very, very comfortable. I got served an ad on Facebook yesterday, and it was proven formula to grow a church from zero to 200 in five months. I'm like, boy, that's comfortable, isn't it? Isn't that neat? They got it all tidied up for you. That's how you do it. I would rather have five spirit-filled people than 500 people just attending a church. (laughs) I mean, 12 changed the world. So the more is just on the other side of comfort. And this is not a one-time filling. This is not a one-time thing. Jesus stood up in John 7, and he, and, he, and he cried out. He said, if anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. In the original language, it's, if anyone is thirsty, let him keep coming and keep drinking. Ephesians 5.18 says this, do not be drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit. In the original language, it's be being filled with the Spirit. The body of Christ is to be in a continual state of being filled. (laughs) Not once. You got saved and the Holy Spirit came and took up residence in you. Woo! Right? That's exciting. There's more. See, when you get saved, you have the Holy Spirit. When you get baptized in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit has you. (sighs) And I'm telling you, there's more. At the end of Mark, it says, these signs shall follow those that believe. And it goes on to, they'll heal the dead, raise, heal the dead, <laughs> heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons, so on and so forth. The original tense there is those that continually believe. And I'm here to tell you there's more, and I'm hoping to whet your appetite for more because you are supposed to go deeper. And I'm, I'm, my hope is that you will desire and hunger for more, that you will not be content with what you've received so far. Your heritage is so rich, guys. I know I've talked about the vineyard like multiple times, but soft place in my heart. The things that have happened through this specific line of believers. I know not every vineyard in the United States or across the world looks the same. And not all of them have even gone after the same things. But I know Matt. I know Matt. (laughs) And I know what he's going after. I know what you guys are going after. You want to go deeper. (laughs) And so I'm telling you, I'm telling you, go deeper because there's more, okay? So we're going to spend some time praying. Does that work for you? Okay, I want to leave. How much time do we have? It's 11, 30? Do we have to get to 30? Or do we have till 30? Okay. So I want to have the worship team come uh, do do some worship stuff. But I want to pray because I believe God's going to do some things today. Um, we saw, we saw it with our own eyes, a miracle happened literally before this service. And that was not because God was like, I'll break one off for him today. (laughs) They're just so earnest about it. It's, it's cute. See, he said yes, 2000 years ago. He already said yes. He already said, I am willing. It's a finished work. So our goal is not to try to convince God to do something today. Our job is to appropriate what he's already done. And so that's what we're going to believe for. Okay? So if you need healing of any sort, you need physical healing of any sort, okay? I want you to raise your hand. So actually, let's all stand because we're just going to go after it. But if you need healing of any sort, I want you to raise your hand. 
and please don't be shy about it. I want you to raise your hand because there's gonna be people that are gonna pray. But not only are there gonna be prayer team members that are gonna pray, but one of the core tenets of Vineyard is everyone gets to play. So it's tag, you're it. So every believer has access to the same Holy Spirit. So you're on the prayer team today. You didn't know it, you didn't sign up for it, but you're on it today. So if someone has their hand up around you, I want you to lay your hands on them. And what we're gonna do is we're not going to ask God to heal them. We're gonna command the pain to go. God does not need to be convinced. I promise you. Randy Clark says this, to assume that you have to convince God to heal someone is to assume that you have more compassion than he does. I'll just let you sit with that one for a second. So let's go after it. Holy Spirit, right now, you are as available as you were on the day of Pentecost. You are available right now in that same measure. And in fact, you go from glory to glory and the increase of your government knows no end. And so Lord, you are increasing your work on the earth. You are moving forward with your work. And we know, Holy Spirit, that that work gets accomplished because of you. So we ask right now in this place for more. We ask in this place right now for more. If you're not praying right now, and, or, or you're not getting prayed for, what I want you to do is just put your hand on the person next to you and I want you to pray for more for that person. Go ahead, lay your hands on them, grab them. I'm, I'm being dead serious, don't be shy. Put your hands on them. Grab them. Because listen, one of the ways the kingdom is transferred is through touch. And so God, our prayer this morning Right now, I guess it's not morning anymore, it's afternoon technically now, but we ask, Lord, more. We ask for more. We ask for more. We ask for more. We ask for more. Lord, for those that are timid in sharing their faith right now, I ask that you would infuse them with boldness in Jesus' name. For those that have been dealing with anxiety, just as we sang this morning, something has to break, we command it to break right now in Jesus' name. Those that are not in their right mind right now, they have all sorts of voices going on in their head. I command them to shut up in Jesus' name, and I pray that there is clarity in their minds right now in Jesus' name. For those that are dealing with pain in their extremities, for those that are dealing with migraines, for those that are dealing with pain in their body, I command it right now to come in line with the word of God. And Lord, we just come to you right now and we say, we will not accept anything less than everything that you have for us right now. We will not be those that just warm seats, Lord. We will not be those that just go on about our day, Lord. Today is a day where everything becomes different. So Lord, put a flagpost in the ground right now and, and, and do what only you can do. Come into this room like a rushing wind, like a roaring fire, and come and burn away anything that doesn't belong. There is more. There is more. So God, bring the more. Bring the more. Bring the more. Lord, I come against depression in Jesus' name right now. Right now, depression, break. Depression, break in Jesus' name. I come against addiction right now in Jesus' name. Freedom in Jesus' name right now. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Freedom right now. If you have your prayer language, begin to pray in your prayer language right now. It's okay. Contextually, it's fine. Just pray in the Spirit. And if you don't have your prayer language and you want it, just ask right now. Just open up to Him right now because He will do it. You may hear just a little bit. You may see just a little bit of a phrase or something. Just let her rip. We love you, Jesus. We love you, Jesus. Now we ask as we move into worship, Lord, continue to minister the hearts. You guys can keep praying as we worship. You don't have to turn away. Keep praying. Keep going after it. Keep pressing in whatever that looks like for you. Keep pressing in. We're going to worship and we're going to believe God to move. We're going to believe him to move in Jesus' name.